In this video, we're going to be talking about the tricep sura. Sura refers to the calf or the posterior aspect of the lower leg. Triceps refers to a three-headed muscle. Now, this is actually a muscle group, so it's not one muscle, it's actually two. One of the muscles we'll see in a minute has one head, and then this one, the gastrocnemius, has two heads, so two plus one is three. Now, the gastrocnemius is a two-headed muscle. Right here's the medial head, and then over here's the lateral head. The lateral head originates from the posterolateral lateral aspect of the lateral condyle of the femur. The medial head right here originates from the posterior surface of the medial femoral condyle, and also the popliteal surface of the femoral shaft. The commonality between the lateral and medial heads of the gastroc is that they both originate from the femur. Hold that in mind. Now if we follow the lateral and medial heads inferiorly, we see that they eventually become continuous with this very thick and large tendon called the calcaneal tendon, more commonly known as the Achilles tendon. And if we follow the Achilles tendon inferiorly, we see that that eventually attaches on the posterior calcaneus, one of the large tarsal bones. In some sources, you might see the insertion written as the Achilles tendon or calcaneal tendon. In others, it may be the posterior calcaneus. But understand, this is one continuous structural system right here. Now, a couple other notes on the origins of the gastroc. Number one, if I asked you which of these heads originates up further, more proximally or more superiorly, you might be tempted to say the lateral head, because look, this red part goes up higher. But this red part way up here is a separate muscle. This is actually the plantaris muscle, which we'll be covering at the end of this video. So if you get rid of this, you'll actually see the medial head originates further up. And so that can be a difficult question if you've never looked at it. But if you see that on an exam, the medial head of the gastroc is up a little bit further than the lateral head of the gastroc. And number two, Remember that I said the origins of the gastroc heads involve the femur. Well, the femur's up here, proximal to the knee joint. And then for the insertion down here, the calcaneus is distal to the ankle joint. So what that means is that the gastrocnemius crosses two joints. It crosses the ankle joint, and it also crosses the knee joint. Therefore, it will have actions at both joints. It is a two-joint muscle. And so the action at the ankle joint is going to be plantar flexion. Now, gastrocnemius does produce a little bit of subtalar inversion, but the major subtalar inverter is actually tibialis posterior, which we'll be covering in the next video. So for the ankle joint, we mainly have plantar flexion. And at the knee joint, the gastrox can facilitate a little bit of knee flexion also. Now granted, the hamstrings are still the major knee flexor, but the gastrox can still participate in it a little bit. Now, the next muscle we're going to see is the soleus muscle. That's the third head of triceps surrey, the gastroc being the first two. The soleus also participates in plantar flexion, but when we consider the plantar flexion provided by each of these muscles, for the soleus, it's going to be more postural, because the soleus contains a much higher degree of type 1 muscle fibers. They're going to be low power, more endurance whereas the gastrocnemius contains a higher proportion of type 2 muscle fibers. And so the gastrocnemius is going to facilitate plantar flexion with more of explosive movements, more power, more force production, and it's going to fatigue more quickly than the soleus because it contains much more type 2 muscle fibers. So just a note there. The innervation of the gastrocnemius, like all the others in this video, is going to be the tibial nerve, which is nerve roots S1 and S2. The blood supply is via the lateral and medial sural arteries, which are actually branches of the larger popliteal artery. The antagonist to gastrocnemius, like the other ones we'll see in this video, is going to be tibialis anterior, which promotes dorsiflexion. And then in order to stretch the gastroc, the ankle is going to be in dorsiflexion with the knees extended or straight. Remember that when you want to stretch a muscle, you look at its actions, and then you put the joints in the opposite positions. So if the gastroc is a plantar flexor, then we stretch it by putting the ankle in dorsiflexion. And because the gastroc participates in knee flexion, it's a two-joint muscle, 
we can further stretch it by having the knee straight, so knee extended, okay? We can also stretch the gastroc this way. Right here, I'm stretching my left gastroc, okay? So ankles dorsiflexed and the knee is straight. This is an example of a wall stretch for the gastrox. Next, we have the soleus muscle. This is the third head of triceps surrey. Right here in green, you see the soleus, and this muscle is deep to the gastroc. So in this picture right here, the gastroc, medial and lateral heads, have been removed, and you can see the underlying soleus muscle. And then the origin of the soleus is going to be on both the tibia and the fibula. The first is the soleal line. This is a physical linear elevation. It's a small bony elevation. Uh, on the posterior aspect of the tibia, and it provides one of the attachments for the soleus. It also attaches on the medial border of the tibia, the head of the fibula, and the posterior border of the fibula. And then like the gastrocnemius, the insertion of the soleus is on the posterior calcaneus down here via the Achilles tendon. So as you go distally on the soleus, eventually it becomes more tendinous like you see here, and that tendinous part blends with the Achilles tendon. And you can't see where it's blending because it's actually deep to what you see right here in the picture, okay? Now, does the soleus cross two joints? No, it crosses the ankle joint, of course, but it doesn't cross the knee joint because it doesn't originate off of the femur. Its origins are on the tibia and the fibula. So the soleus, unlike the gastroc, is a one joint muscle. And so it only facilitates plantar flexion. Now again, it also gives you a little bit of subtalar inversion, but the major action is going to be plantar flexion. But because the soleus does not cross the knee joint, it has no actions at the knee joint. So all we have is plantar flexion at the ankle. The innervation of soleus is via the tibial nerve with nerve roots S1 and S2, and the blood supply is twofold. So the superior or proximal part of soleus is supplied by the popliteal artery, and the inferior or distal aspect of the soleus is supplied by the fibular or the peroneal artery. The major antagonist to soleus is the tibialis anterior, and the way that you stretch this muscle is with the ankles in dorsiflexion and the knees slightly flexed as you see right here. The reason you have the knees flexed is because remember, when the knees are extended, we maximize stretch of the gastrocnemius. You'll still get some stretch of the soleus, but we're getting a lot of the gastroc. When we flex the knees, we're minimizing the stretch to the gastrocnemius, and so more of that stretch can be targeted or focused on the soleus. So understand that regardless of whether the knees are extended or flexed, you're still stretching both muscles, but we're biasing the stretch of one over the other. So knees extended is the gastroc, knees flexed is the soleus. And you can also do a wall stretch in the same way. Again, we're stretching the left soleus here. I know it's the soleus because my left knee is a little bit flexed. Now, the only two muscles included in the triceps surrey are the two heads of gastroc and the soleus. All these others back here are referred to as the deep sural muscles, or sometimes the deep muscles of the posterior compartment. The plantaris is one of these, and it's a very interesting muscle. You actually see it right here. Here's the plantaris. It has a very short muscle belly, and then a very long, thin tendon that's sometimes mistaken as a nerve when people are dissecting the lower leg. So the origin of the plantaris is the lateral supracondylar line of the femur, so you already know this crosses the knee joint, and also off of the oblique popliteal ligament, which is a deep ligament within uh, the posterior aspect of the knee. And then the insertion of the plantaris is the posterior calcaneus via the Achilles tendon. So if we look at the muscle belly of plantaris, we said it's really short. It turns into a long, thin tendon right here, which actually goes superficial to the soleus. So if you're actually looking at the depth of these muscles, the most superficial is gastroc, followed by the tendon of plantaris, and the deepest is the soleus, okay? Now, if we follow this tendon down, eventually it will attach onto the Achilles tendon. Now, an important note here, when you're actually dissecting the lower leg, what you actually see is that this tendon can easily be ripped off of the Achilles tendon. And you'll see this really long string-like structure that actually coils up really quickly. 
So it does attach on the Achilles tendon, but it does not 100% blend, meaning you can actually isolate the tendon of plantaris from the Achilles tendon. And then the actions of the plantaris muscle, theoretically, are ankle plantar flexion and knee flexion. And the reason I say theoretically will be made apparent in just a minute. Innervation of the plantaris is the same as all the other muscles, tibial nerve with nerve roots S1 and S2. And I find it interesting that such a tiny muscle actually has two sources of blood. Superficially, plantaris is supplied by the lateral sural and popliteal arteries, and the deep part of the muscle is supplied by the superior lateral genicular artery. Again, the antagonist to this muscle theoretically would be tibialis anterior, and you would also stretch this muscle in the same way as you do the gastrocnemius, because the actions of this muscle would be the same. So you would stretch the plantaris in a position of dorsiflexion with the knee extended, although no one specifically targets the plantaris for stretch. And here's why that is, and here's why I said that these actions are theoretical. So if you look at the size of the plantaris muscle, it is minuscule compared to the gastrocnemius and the soleus combined. And even this picture, the size of the muscle is exaggerated. It is very, very small. So if you look at the force that's provided by the plantaris and compare it to that provided by the soleus and the gastrocnemius combined, the amount of force that the plantaris is going to be able to provide is absolutely negligible. And when you have a situation like that, people often look for other functions of these tiny muscles. So what they might do is they might take a sample of that muscle and look at the concentration of muscle spindles. Remember that muscle spindles are proprioceptive receptors or proprioceptors. And proprioceptors relay information to the brain, particularly the cerebellum, on joint position. So the brain knows the relative position of the ankle joint. Is it in neutral? Is it dorsiflexed? Is it plantar flexed? And to what extent? And it turns out that the plantaris muscle actually does have a high concentration of these muscle spindles, which led people to theorize that rather than being a force producer, it is instead a proprioceptive organ. Well, that has also been debunked because removal of the plantaris muscle or absence of it has absolutely no effect on ankle proprioception or the amount of plantar flexion that can be produced at the ankle joint. So, that being said, they concluded that the plantaris is likely vestigial in humans. It just has no function. Now, I will say this. If you manage to rupture the plantaris muscle or tendon, it will produce pain. After all, it is a physical structure with many receptors, including nociceptors, so it can be a pain generator if it's injured, but that is extremely uncommon to rupture the plantaris. So nothing more exciting than that. It's just likely a vestigial organ, but you can probably still be asked about these various things on an exam. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the triceps surrey and the plantaris muscle. In the next video, we're going to be covering the other deep sural muscles, including the tibialis posterior and then some of the toe flexors. So make sure to join us there. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.